Thank you. Thank you very much. I think I'm mic'd and it's working. Yes, you can hear me well. Uh, it's always a pleasure. I love talking to anyone about stroke, actually. I've been working in this field for a very long time. Uh, and it's really great to talk to people uh, who are interested in the field. And always at the beginning of my talk, I like to ask how many of you, how many of you know someone who's had a stroke? So if you wouldn't mind putting your hands up. So I'd like you to look around the room. Keep your hands up. So this is how touched we are by stroke in our society. So one of the things that is remarkable to me is it's one of the few diseases that has never had government support. That's my last political statement. But isn't it amazing? Here we have a disease, as Amanda said, that affects one in six people. So it's not something that's very rare and uncommon. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about stroke. Stroke is disabling, it's deadly, but it's also inspiring. We know that there are lots of people who have been famous who've had a stroke, and here's three. You'll <coughs> recognise them, no doubt, uh, including Winston Churchill, and uh, as Amanda said, I'm a recipient of one of his fellowships, <coughs> Harry Grant, and this is Dame, this is our famous opera singer, Dame Nellie Melba. So these three people all died of stroke. But at the other end of the spectrum, at the contemporary level, we also have uh, great stories of inspiring people. And here I've put um, profiled two people who are quite young, and young stroke is an area that we're becoming increasingly intrigued with and think it's a very important area for us to explore because it's a complex disease and we know less about young stroke than we do about older stroke. But here is um, Emma and Alex, who both have had their strokes quite young. And Emma, in fact, has written a book uh, called Reinventing Emma, which is a fantastic read if you ever are interested in looking at the experience of young stroke. So, as part of my public service as well, I always like to talk about why it's so important that we understand this message, which is the FAST message. And some of you will have seen this. It comes out um, usually around Stroke Week once a year. It's from the Stroke Foundation here in Australia. And it's our, as part of our education to teach people about the importance of identifying stroke quickly. Face, arm, speech, time. So that's the, the message that you'll see. Importantly, these are not the only signs of stroke. Stroke is something that happens quickly. Uh, it's a sudden onset condition. And just to give you a little bit of the, the pathology of it, it's <coughs> typically caused by a clot into a blood vessel in the brain. Of course, our blood vessels in our brain, brain are incredibly fine and complex. They're sort of the, the tiniest little vessels. And as um, things break off in other parts of the body, they lodge here in the brain. And that's the case in about 80% of cases. And then in the other 20% of cases, it's due to a bleed. So where the lining or the wall of a blood vessel gives way and there's blood that goes into the brain. In either circumstance, uh, there are things that we can do that can be done if we act quickly. And I'll talk a bit about this as part of uh, my talk today. So FAST will come up a few times. It's really important that you know. And if you see anyone that you think is having a sudden onset of a neurological change, call an ambulance and uh, you might be able to get them to hospital really quickly. Okay, so as Amanda said, our group is quite large. So we've just recently had the 15th annual um, scientific meeting of um, the Flory Stroke Group and it included our collaborators and this is um, a photograph of our group from a few weeks back. We do this every year to try and think about what is the next thing that we need to focus on for research. But today I'm going to talk to you about collaboration. I'm going to give you some updates about treatments uh, that are time critical. I'm going to talk to you about exercise because this is a, an important field of work, particularly of uh, my group. And also I'm going to talk to you about hospitals, which sort of might seem a bit odd, but it will all become clear as we go along, I hope. And I mostly want you to take away that I think there is enormous hope for stroke recovery. But this is something that is 
uh, an area of research that we are very focused on and uh, we still got quite a long way to go. But I'll talk to you a bit about that as we go along as well. So, this is a, a nice quote um, about hope. And to me it reflects, I think, my own interest in stroke and my own objectives um, around what I see as the future. So, hope can flourish only when you believe that what you can do can make a difference and that your actions can bring a future different from the present one. And I think as researchers that very much reflects um, what our objectives are. We are trying to imagine a different um, place into the future. So, if we talk about recovery after stroke, then I'm going to tell you first about some really exciting results uh, that came out just last year. Um, this is a study called Extend IA. It's a study that was conducted um, across multiple centres but led out of the Royal Melbourne Hospital with collaborators, uh, very close collaborators in the Flory and also with our um, stroke uh, our director of the Flory, um, Geoffrey Donnan, who himself is a, a really world famous um, stroke doctor. So in this uh, study, and this was just one of a series of studies, but what they did was compare what we know now as some of our very fast gold standard treatment, which is to get people to hospital very quickly and to deliver them if they've had a clot with a clot busting drug called TPA. Now on top of that, there's been new treatments that have been experimented with over a number of years and this is called clot retrieval. So apart from giving a clot busting drug, there is also a way in which a catheter can be inserted up um, through your vessels into your brain to where the clot is found and it can be extracted uh, with this sort of interesting little devices that they use around um, in very, very small vessels. Now, clot extraction can completely reverse uh, the signs of stroke. And that's quite a revelation. So clot busting can radically improve, in many cases, um, someone's outcome from stroke. But this really does add additional benefit. So this was um, led by Bruce Campbell and by Peter Mitchell uh, over at, with Geoffrey Donnan, as I said, and um, Stephen Davis involved in this project. It was very, very exciting. Now, what I want you to take away from this is that this is one of the fast treatments. So these are time-critical treatments and they need to be delivered really quickly. So it's about identifying stroke and getting to hospital. So then we have also want better recovery with the treatment. So this is just to show you a few graphs. I promise I don't have very many. But this is one of the results where it's time spent in the first 90 days at home after you've had a stroke. And this is the gold standard that we had before, the clot busting drug. And you can see that the average day at home was 15 days in the first 90. When you add in the endovascular treatment where you take the clot out, you can see that there's a much uh, higher amount of time that you spend at home. It's a much, much better recovery. And this is time in rehabilitation. If you have a look on the other graph, you can see that if you can get this combination treatment, uh, you don't even need to go to rehabilitation, you just walk out. Now, not everyone does that, but that's really exciting stuff. Very, very exciting in our field. So one of the things that we're doing here uh, at the Flory is uh, the Flory has really driven the development of um, the Victorian Stroke Medicine Program. So this is extending access to best ev evidence care. And what this means is that if you're out in the countryside and you have a stroke, before you couldn't access or you had difficulty accessing these treatments, now uh, the group, and there's a couple of the um, people who are really critical to that program in the audience today, uh, you can get access to a neurologist in uh, metropolitan Melbourne and that person will be able to look at the scans um, of your brain and advise about delivery of treatment and also advise if you can need to come back in so, uh, or to a centre that can give you clot retrieval. So these are the statistics right now. You know, this is happening in 14 different hospitals with two more expected to come later in the year. And that's pretty exciting. There are 12 neurologists on seven days a week, 36, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. 
so no matter day or night. And they've had nearly a thousand consultations using this program. So that's very exciting. And the expansion's planned um, not only outside of Victoria, but also into the field of telerehabilitation. And we talked about this at our meeting um, a few weeks back. So the other thing that's on the horizon is the stroke ambulance. And this is probably going to be in Melbourne's um, laneways from next year. Uh, again, this is driven by um, Geoffrey Donnan and Stephen Davis have been at the heart of this. It's going to look something like this. And inside this ambulance is a portable um, in-ambulance CAT scan. This is the imaging system that we need to be able to tell if you've got the type of stroke that we can treat with a clot-busting drug. And if we can get that quicker and then telemedicine that into the hospitals, then there's again uh, a reduction in um, faster diagnosis but a reduction in treatment time. And time is brain, you will have heard that. The longer time that we spend with our brains in this critical um, crisis state with uh, the clot or the bleed, the worse our outcomes. So this is a very exciting um, endeavour and something that you'll see happening. Again though, it's all about fast. So now I'm going to talk about stroke recovery. So the early bit was about recovery after stroke and early treatments help recovery. But then there's a lot of people that will never access those treatments, either because they have the wrong type of stroke and can't be treated with it, or because they can't get to hospital within four and a half hours of stroke. And that's a lot of people. So that's where my group come in. So those of us who are interested in stroke recovery. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, our centre of research excellence is the first thing. So collaboration um, is a really big uh, area in this um, space right now. We have been uh, rather broken up in our efforts, certainly in Australia. There's pockets of people doing work all over the country. And what we did is come together and say, let's put together um, an application for us to our large National Health and Medical Research Council for a centre of excellence to, to provide a, a focal point in Australia for us to look at stroke recovery. And um, the website is just live now. There'll be a lot more things um, coming up on, on the website, but that's its detail. <coughs> what we want people to do is sign up if you're interested so that we can send you information. Um, we want to be able to provide information about the kind of research that we're doing. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the things that we are doing as part of that program. But the other thing is that it is a, a real opportunity for us to have this coordinating and sort of collective focus to gain momentum in um, the recovery space. Uh, you'll see as I talk, there's lots of little Twitter symbols here because we're very interested in social media. Uh, at least my group is, so if you want to follow the Stroke CRE, you can follow it on that handle there. So just to take you to a few things um, around this Centre of Excellence. So this is a, a photograph of some of the, the team leaders at the top. We have a focus between two major hubs in Australia, Hunter Medical Research Institute and the University of Newcastle, and the Florey, and the Florey is the, the lead institute um, and we are together looking at developing uh, interventions in our clinical trial space. That's one of the areas that um, I'm very keen on. I do a lot of um, clinical research trying to look at developing new interventions. But also looking at understanding more about the brain biology behind recovery. It is remarkable that we actually know so little about how the brain recovers. <coughs> Now you would have heard a lot about plasticity. Uh, we know about brain plasticity. This is something that is sort of bread and butter in a neuroscience institute. Uh, what, what we don't know about is the best way of harnessing that and in really encouraging those changes after stroke. But we're very close to some exciting things in this space. So we're trying to understand brain biology. We're looking at really interesting um, technology around brain imaging to study recovery pathways in people with stroke. We're trying to, instead of think of stroke as a one disease, which is what's happened for a really, really long time, 
we are now trying to identify within all stroke different types, so phenotypes is the, the jargon term that we use, different types of people who respond to different things. So rather than treating everyone the same, we treat people specifically for their condition. So we're making progress along those lines as well. We also have an area of research at the basic science level, which is looking at stress and fatigue, because these are two things which in the human condition after stroke are really hard to deal with. And if we can understand them more from a biological perspective, then we can develop treatments for fatigue as well and for stress. So those are some of the areas. We're also looking at implementing best practice. I'll talk about that in a minute. And we're training the next generation of researchers. That's a really key objective of um, these centres of research excellence. So we started this last year and we have five years of funding to be able to try and move this forward. Now in the normal scheme of things, that's you know, a small amount of money, but we're using it to the absolute best advantage we can. And these are the things that we want to do. We want to increase and improve our knowledge about brain recovery, and we want to be able to get better patient selection, which is about this issue of not treating everyone the same. Uh, and we're going to do a lot more in the trial space, and we're focused on translation and going back into the community. And we are really keen to talk with consumers. So next year, in 2017, we'll be holding a um, seminar. We have them twice a year, but we'll be holding one that is particularly targeted towards um, consumer engagement. So please watch the space. So one of the first things that I wanted to do when we started uh, the centre was get an international collaboration forming. And so um, it took about a year to get up and running, but we had it this year in May. And I invited uh, 60 international experts who work across both basic science, so looking at biology, into the clinical domain and into looking at how you develop interventions to, for testing in, in um, stroke re re research um, studies. And there's the photos of the groups here. And what we did was we spent a year looking at developing um, recommendations, trying to actually speak the same language. It was really interesting how we had to define so many of the terms that we were using because everyone was using them slightly differently. We also had to define the brain recovery timeline based on knowledge that we could gain from the preclinical science, so from our animal information, both in rodents and in um, non-human primates. So a lot of our work happened beforehand, and then we met for two days um, in Philadelphia, and we developed recommendations about how we need to change what we're doing in terms of our research to really drive and get more momentum in this recovery space. And we were very, very excited at the end of that because a couple of things became very obvious. One was that if we started all pointing in the same direction, we were much likely to accelerate uh, recovery in, uh, in this area. And the other is that we're aiming too low. Everyone agreed that we're aiming too low. And it was on the back of that that I was fortunate enough um, to be invited to the World Economic Forum in June to talk about stroke recovery. And if you're interested, it's a five minute, I'm not playing it now, but it's a five minute uh, YouTube video. Um, what I was talking about was what do we need to change to get to a better uh, place in terms of recovery. And what they called it was envisioning a cure for stroke. Now, when I first talked about that, as a researcher, you always feel a little bit uncomfortable having something that is so aspirational because we're grounded in facts, that's what we are. But to me, when I thought about it, this is absolutely what has to happen in stroke recovery if we're going to make a difference. We have to actually aim really high and we need to aim for brain repair. And uh, our group was very excited about that. So it's all about, again, aiming setting our sights higher than we have in the past and looking at hope for recovery. Now I'm going to touch on some of the research that uh, we're doing here at the Flory. Uh, 
you know, in a bit more detail. But just to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we're doing, and I'm going to focus uh, on these areas around exercise and physical activity because I think they're an important area and one that you probably can all relate to. So as you know, I'm sure exercise actually is a great preventer for stroke, along with other, um, other important things like managing your blood pressure and uh, not drinking too much and being physically active and uh, uh, exercise is part of that physical activity piece. And we are very interested in understanding the role of exercise and how exercise can improve both um, the environment of the brain during a critical period after recovery. So there are whole brain effects of exercise and there are very specific effects which are really interesting when we look at them more closely. So I'm just going to talk about these four areas uh, over the next couple of minutes. So first of all, if we look at uh, fitness, so Liam Johnson's one of the postdocs in my group. He's an exercise physiologist. And um, one of the things that we know happens really quickly with any injury, but really quickly with stroke, is that there are profound deconditioning effects that happen really fast after someone has a stroke. Now, these effects are not just related to resting in bed, uh, although they compound the problem. They're also related to the injury itself. And so part of what we're trying to do is work out when can we start exercising people to help them not have that really rapid deconditioning that we see, which of course is actually really hard to recover from. So once you become deconditioned, you then need to work against that deconditioning to get to your full potential. So making sure that we can help stop the deconditioning is an important facet. But also, if uh, you can do exercise early, there are um, encouraging effects around um, looking at brain repair and plasticity. We certainly see that in animal research. We see a lot of evidence for exercise helping us create um, a better brain recovery after stroke. So Liam's working at two different levels. One, he's the first uh, person here in Australia to develop an exercise laboratory, which is out at, uh, at the Austin Hospital for people with acute stroke. And we have developed some really safe exercise testing protocols for people that can be started within five days of stroke onset. Now that's really early. A lot of our research at the moment sits out at three months or six months after stroke. So we have to bring it back up into an earlier time point to stop some of these detrimental effects. The other thing that we're working towards is developing a cardiac style rehab program for people with stroke. So cardiac rehab is absolutely standard for anyone that has a heart attack. Uh, in stroke, we have no such standard sort of fitness oriented, uh, education combined package that will help people get onto the pathway for being physically active after stroke. The other important thing with exercise is that it's actually one of the key things that we can do to prevent further stroke. So if you've had a stroke, exercise prevents further stroke. And so if we can do anything to help people develop exercise habits that allow them to continue after they've had their period of hospitalisation into the future, that's a really, really good thing. So that's one of the things that Liam is um, starting up right now, which is this program for the stroke care. Now I'm going to tell you a bit about fatigue. Now, 50% of people who have a stroke experience fatigue. That's amazing. It's very high. We didn't realise it was so high. Toby Cumming, who's uh, again one of my postdocs, has just completed a lovely review pulling together data from um, all the studies that we can find looking at stroke and fatigue. And that's the level that we find in the literature, 50% of people. Now, fatigue is not just, oh, I'm a bit weary. Fatigue is profound. In people with stroke, it's a profound sense of tiredness and it's different to how we feel after we've been physically active and we're tired from that. 
Uh, in fact, uh, Toby was involved in uh, a podcast on fatigue with um, the Stroke Foundation, and that can be found on the Enable Me um, platform. And it was really interesting to hear about suggestions about how people are managing fatigue, because it is a key, key problem. So what are we doing? Well, this is how complex fatigue is. So fatigue is not one thing. We don't really understand exactly uh, what its causes are. But the more physically inactive you are, you end up with these kinds of problems. You have muscle deconditioning, low fitness, increased energy costs. So it takes you more energy when you're trying to move around. And there's a relationship definitely with fatigue in both directions. And also physical activity and stroke are related to depression, low arousal and poor sleep. So what you end up with is this really complex and rather difficult um, scenario. So what we're trying to do here is a clinical trial. It's running at the moment. Uh, there's been 20 people who've participated in this study. It's called FAST, Fatigue After Stroke. And we're trying to get people who have fatigue and they are uh, varyingly affected by depression or not. And we put them into pairs and they use uh, an activity app on a, tele on a telephone to help them uh, look after and uh, monitor their exercise. There's an exercise intervention and a range of other things that we do in addition. So this is uh, something that is going on right now. And then in the Cognitive Neuroscience Group, which is led by Amy Brotman, uh, we're also involved in looking at uh, exercise and its relationship to cognitive function. So we do know that uh, in the brain, especially around the hippocampus, exercise can maintain the integrity of your hippocampus, which is important for a lot of the thinking bits that we do. And with that, uh, we see that it is maintained in people who have uh, exercised in the, into older years. It can increase if you exercise and you haven't done it before. It can actually slow down deterioration of dementia. And in this instance, we're interested in trying to slow down some of the brain shrinkage that happens after people have a stroke. So in this uh, example, we're also looking at a trial where we're comparing a balance program with an exercise program that has a <coughs> fitness and strength component. And we're looking at its effect on cognitive function and mood, and also on markers of health, both brain and body health around um, BDNF and also um, glucose. So this is a project that's, again, um, ongoing right now. And then the other piece of work that I'll tell you about is work around um, recovery. This was work of mine and my large um, group, uh, where we did a trial that went over five countries and in recruited over 2,000 patients. And in that study, we were looking at whether introducing a physical activity and exercise component early within the first 24 hours of stroke onset actually could prevent um, complications and improve outcome. So we're looking here at um, having a better quality of life, but also actually having a better functional outcome. So you're much more able to do things. Well, this was published in The Lancet last year. This study was completed and it was an enormous undertaking with over a thousand uh, staff from different hospitals from around the world. Um, so it really needs to be acknowledged that it was an enormous effort. But what we found that was less expected was that if we start doing too much too early, it actually can impair progress. So we found that people who were doing really intensive training, which everyone thought was the right thing to do, starting really early, were not as well off as the people who were doing a lighter amount of exercise. So this has really turned thinking on its head and it's been a very important study for reframing um, what we think about early exercise, but also about giving us some direction of where we need to go next. 
So there is some intriguing um, findings in there about something to do with how infrequent, having infrequent bouts rather than big long bouts of exercise and how important that might be for recovery. But we need to do more research and we're looking at doing another study probably of a similar size over the next um, several years if we get the funding. Now I'm going to go back to the hospital issue because why am I interested in hospitals? How does that fit into a, a research program that is actually a lot about the brain, even though I haven't shown you lots of images of the brain while, we're, uh, while I've been talking, but a lot about recovery. So if you remember earlier, I was talking about um, this collaboration around the stroke recovery and rehab um, round table that we held. So in that round table, we talked a lot about um, not just the things that we have to fix that are physical, but also um, some of the, th in terms of our research, the approaches that we're using. But one of the things that has always struck me is this importance of thinking about the brain environment interaction. So I have been working in hospitals most of my career. This was me early on. I trained as a physiotherapist. And these are some of the hospitals that I've worked in over that time. So I feel like I've actually got a fairly good uh, understanding of what it's like working in hospital. And I hadn't really thought about, apart from whinging about how awful the hospitals were at several times in my career, I hadn't really thought about what we could do about that. What could we do about that? Because the hospitals are pretty poorly designed often. And then as I've been going through my research career and looking at the environment and how important the environment is, including exercise, but social and physical activity, and this comes from a lot of preclinical work, but it's really, really clear when we look at humans that we need social, physical and cognitive stimulation. That helps enhance brain repair. In rodents, it helps enhance brain repair, we think, in humans. So you can't look at that without looking at the environment. So one of the things that I've done over the years is I've studied lots about what people are doing in the environments. I've studied how active they are. I've studied where they are. I've studied who they're with. I've studied what they do throughout their day. I have enormous data about what people do while they're in hospitals. And some of that data has been gathered in other countries and it's remarkable how similar it is across different places. It's not the same everywhere. You can change it and that's really important. But we have also added studies where we're looking at adding in enrichment, enriching activities into hospitals. And what impact does that have on people who are recovering from stroke? Well, in our pilot study that was conducted a couple of years ago led by Heidi Jansen, we found that if we add in these enriching activities into a normal rehab hospital environment, and I can tell you more about that in the question time, but the activities, um, then people's, uh, their engagement with things that are cognitively stimulating and socially stimulating were much higher. That was the first pilot. Now we've expanded that into four hospitals in about 200 patients. We're nearly done with this study and we're looking at expanding it into and adding in these enrichment activities into hospital to see what impact they have on outcome. So that study is ongoing. But then we also look at interviewing people and we ask them about what's going on and we also synthesise information and see uh, how, what are the key themes that are coming out when you interview people who've been in hospital with stroke going through rehabilitation. And these are the kinds of themes that we see that are emerging from those uh, interviews. People are bored in hospital. It's a very strong theme. The disempowering theme is very strong. The communication theme, so lack of communication, how people interact with each other, these are all really challenging. And fatigue comes out again when we talk to people. So, what is important about this is we start thinking about, well, how could the environment impact what people are doing while they're in hospital? And the answer is it can do a lot. So I've been working with architects and others for about four years to try and look at how we can redesign hospitals. 
But this is the kicker, of course, this brain-environment interaction. So when we think of, as neuroscientists, we tend to focus on this little fantastic piece of apparatus up in our heads. But of course, whenever we think of it, we have to think about the fact that a brain is in a body and a body is doing something. And context can be everything. So when we're thinking about hospitals, we need to think about them as a potential additional treatment component to all the other stuff that we're doing while we're in hospital. So it should be part of treatment. So if we're looking at brain repair, we should be thinking about the hospital and its impact on that. So what we're really trying to do is get a radical redesign of um, rehabilitation hospitals. And to do that, I've put together a group who are a really fantastic group of people interested in this concept of really um, taking another look at how we design healthcare. So in Australia, we have um, people from Queensland, Heidi and Marcus and Alan, who are both at the School of um, Design here at University of Melbourne. And Lena Cherilov, who's at the Florian, he's a decision scientist and he's very uh, expert at looking at systems and how all the systems flow together. We also have um, Kate uh, uh, Kirk and um, Adel Shepley from the US who are part of uh, a movement around evidence-based architecture. And Mari Elf, who's also uh, from Sweden and part of a group who are, of architects who are interested in how we go about co-designing hospitals. So together, we make up a group who are actually very interested in this field and able to look at blue sky thinking but we also need partners and the partners need to be patients and carers. And of course, we need scientists and designers and people who wayfinding and people interested in technology. How do we change and increase technology in hospitals? And of course, policy makers. So this project, which I've called the Fable Hospital, um, is going to look something like this. And we're just waiting to find out if we've got funding for this project. And it's, a, it's a, a virtuous cycle where we're integrating evidence-based healthcare. So what do we know about what we should be doing to treat people and how do we put that into our building? So knowing what the best care is. And then looking at evidence-based architecture. So what bits do we know have evidence about the built space that contribute to well-being? and we bring them into the same uh, conversation early on. So what improves outcome from these two areas? And then you have to put some constraints around it. We can't make it so expensive that no one would ever build it. But then we bring in our consult group of experts to do really blue sky thinking around how we redesign hospitals. We use design science to model this all out and we can change parameters to see which bit's going to make a difference. And then we keep changing that again. And then we're going to use virtual reality here as a way of mocking up the building designs so that we can use that as part of the decision-making process when we're looking at alternatives. And of course, we'll have to go around in iterations to make this happen. But at the end of it, there will be, a, a hopefully, a design of a new rehab hospital and that hospital will be uh, made available, um, the design will be made available to anyone who's interested. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to use research in this context to work outside of the, the current constraints that the architects tell us are really problematic in their space, which is that they don't have time to have really good consultations with stakeholders, with the patients, with the family, with the staff, and that there are such constraints put on the project that they can't come up with anything that's innovative. So the concept behind this piece of research is that we're going to allow them some freedom to make those really innovative steps and see what we come up with. So I'm looking forward to that and we have um, some PhD students already who are starting to look at the issue of design and um, who come from clinical backgrounds and that's exciting. So I think my concluding remarks need to be the following. Stroke recovery is absolutely the next frontier in stroke medicine. 
You know, those of us who work in this space, we look to the acute care people who I showed you at the beginning of this talk. We have treatments that if you can get to hospital quickly, can make a radical difference. You won't need rehab in many circumstances. So that is so exciting and they are amazing breakthroughs. Now, we've got to turn our attention to the other end, which is from the time after you can't get that treatment to the months, years out, which is the recovery space. And that is a very complicated area to work in, but a very worthwhile and exciting area, I think, for us to work in. We have opportunities to look at interventions that use combination treatments to reopen closed windows that we know about, where the brain seems to have stopped its ability to recover. We have opportunity to look at stem cell treatments and bring those into the mix. And there are some really new studies coming out about that now. But it's likely that whatever we do that is going to be the breakthrough treatment for recovery is going to be something that is multimodal. It will have a couple of different components that will also include um, rehabilitation, traditional methods of rehab and training. But it is absolutely the next frontier and it needs a big, big push. As I said earlier in the talk, I think the other thing that we have to stop doing is talk about being pessimistic. Now, I'll reflect back that when I was training years ago, 30 years ago now, uh, they did think that we couldn't really do much at all about stroke. That as soon as you had the stroke and the swelling went down, then whatever you were able to get back from that was good luck and, you know, off you go. We know that's not true now. We know that the brain has an enormous capacity to continue to change. So our challenge as people who work in the stroke recovery space is to work out how we harness this new knowledge to create the cure. And although I am, as I said, slightly uncomfortable with saying the cure, I think it's a great aspiration. And if we aim higher, then we're going to do much more than we've been doing in the past. So I'm happy to hang my hat on that for now. I think the other thing is that we're starting to push together and that is a very exciting um, uh, progress in our field, working much more collaboratively and we are growing the next generation of researchers. And as you saw, a lot of them are multimodal, they're doing different things within their research. And I think we just need to keep focusing on bringing this momentum forward and building the collaborations. So those are my sort of closing remarks, I think it's a watch this face and it's also, as I said, about hope and it's hope for what we're going to be able to do in the future. And so we need to acknowledge, of course, all the many funders, I've probably missed people who aren't on this slide, but thank you, including um, our donors. Thank you very much. Thank you.